Greetings everyone and welcome back to 365 Days of Prague. Today we're going to be reviewing Q Roan by John Greaves and Peter Blegvad. Hi, my name's Naomi. I'm an avid progressive rock fan, but I'm a long ways from knowing all the Prague albums out there. But this year, I'm going to give it a try. This is 365 Days of Prague. Out of all the names of the bands and individual artists that I've said throughout this series, something tells me that the name Peter Blegvad is one that I'm pronouncing entirely wrong, but I just don't know how you're supposed to say it, I don't know what the origin of said name is, so it might even be something like Peter Bleve for all I'm concerned, I actually have no idea. Anyway, here's some of my favorite bits from this album. So today's album is one of those very much typical Canterbury scene albums in soul, mind and heart, only that it's not a Canterbury scene album in its body because it was made all the way across the pond in the USA. But not that it matters that much and honestly I'm jumping myself a bit, so let's firstly talk about the creation and what led to it of this very unique hidden gem. So the two creators of today's album, which I'm not entirely sure how you're supposed to pronounce its name, is it like Kuron? I, I really don't know. Anyway, the two creators have seen their career peaks in individual yet also coinciding bands, of course being John Greaves from Henry Cow and Peter Blegvad who's actually originally from the US but he was part of the semi-English semi-German band of Slap Happy. And in the year of 1974 the two bands actually had their first joint effort in creating an album together which was called Desperate Straits and on that album there exists a song which is called Bad Alchemy and that is the first instance of both Greaves and Blegvad had working together to compose and write a song. And the second collaborative effort of the two bands actually came with 1975's Henry Cow album which we reviewed quite recently on the series of course being in praise of learning. Now around 1976 Blackvad would actually leave Slap Happy and move back to the US where he actually worked as an illustrator for backgrounds for the Peanut films which in my personal opinion is just the cutest thing ever. And in the same year John Greaves would also also leave Henry Cow and go to the US in order to work with Blackvad on a joint project. And this project will actually be pitched beforehand to both Slap Happy and Henry Cow's record label which was of course the Virgin record label and the label themselves actually approved of this and thus the two began working on an album that they would call q Roan. Now this album was mostly composed by Greaves which of course he has a lovely sense of composition but the thing is there is another major part of this album and that's the lyrics for it which were written almost entirely by Blegvad. At this time of his life, Blackvad became quite infatuated with a relationship between images and words, and thus he actually illustrated for this album a bunch of tiny individual illustrations which would be included in the gatefold for the album, and only when seeing them does the listener actually get some context to some of the lyrics of certain songs, and without them they would mostly look as if they're very much nonsensical. And Blackvad would actually note afterwards that one of the reasons that he opted to actually use complex 
lyrics, which are very odd for the reader, is because he wanted to cope with the very complex music that Greaves was making for this album, which he even particularly found hard to play. And in October of 1976, the two would record this album together, joined by an assortment of other players, and specifically a vocalist called Lisa Herman, which she does almost all of the vocals throughout the entire album, and thus she even got credited for it on the album cover and group credits as a whole. And the album would be recorded in the US as I said in Woodstock, New York, and in 1977 the album would finally see the light of day. Now this album is classified as a Canterbury scene type album, but I would also say that it does tiptoe quite a bit with rock in opposition, as seeing the two main members that made this album came from Rio bands originally. Now the thing is, it doesn't really matter what you say about this one, and even if you don't think that Canterbury scene can qualify for albums that were made outside of Canterbury, well, I don't know, it just has the spirit of it, and honestly, if Super Sisters present from Nancy made the cut, then so can this one. Now this album, as it started off, it was definitely quite peculiar, and I thought to myself, you know what, I don't think I'm gonna like this one, seeing as it's kinda out of my comfort zone. But as the songs kept coming on, I just started realizing that they're actually really really good, and I started noting the fact that this album was really enjoyable. I think that around the third track, which I'm not gonna hits name it's too long but that one really opened my eyes to the real beauty of this album the songs they're beautifully executed and they are quite odd but they're also being carried by lisa herman's vocals which are honestly just godlike in some sense and i loved it so so much even if it was not in my own comfort zone the fourth track being the title track of q Ron, is one that i personally think is the first one i can say that i loved from this entire album it really is an interesting track and it also kind of just teases the listener in a way and tests them to see if they're even committed to this type of music and honestly by this point I was fairly committed but if there's one favorite from this album it's actually not this one but the track to come afterwards and that's of course the fifth track called Pipeline. This track out of all things so far was definitely the most surprising. It utilizes a very interesting groove of bossa nova. Again nothing that I would really expect from this album but it sounds so good and again with Herman's vocals just brilliant it is undoubtedly a very cool track which is just very fun to listen to and honestly sometimes you just gotta stop being that critical and start enjoying the music you're listening to and that's definitely what happened to me on this one and the other cool thing about this track is that aside from the music itself as I said lyrics do play a big part in this album and this was definitely the first one which I've really paid attention to the lyrics because they were just pulling me in. They are so fictional yet so vivid at the same time it's just very good. By the track other footnote I started realizing how good this album was. Specifically on this one I love the atonality paired with the wackiness of this entire thing. They just combined very well together and I think that it made for a very cool and very engaging track. And by the track Nine Mineral Emblems, well I realized that this album was a masterpiece. Maybe not a a favorite of mine and I do find some flaws within it and as I said it doesn't really fit comfortably in my comfort zone but honestly it's a hidden gem and it's really really good for that matter. I might not think that this one is an entirely perfect masterpiece but there is one person that actually did think so and he's no other than Robert Wyatt himself. It is said that when this album came out Wyatt bought not one but two vinyl copies of this one in case the one gets damaged he could always replace it with a second one and still be able to listen to this album without interruption and I just think that it's beautiful to see and you can definitely see where he actually took a lot of inspirations from this one seeing as he did want to experiment with things like vocals and lyrics and stuff like that and well this one is just a peak example of all of that. One more track to note from this entire album is the last one called Gegenstand. Now this one it's not that special but I do have some thoughts about it and I wanted to share it with you you guys because you might agree with me. So a lot of you keen viewers that actually know a bit of the world of Prague and Pink Floyd in particular, you might know that there was an era in which Pink Floyd actually wanted to create an entire album made entirely 
entirely from household objects. And well, while that never really happened, this track kind of sounds like what you might expect from an album like that. It is made entirely or at least partially by household objects, and it sounds really odd, but in another sense it also sounds good good, and I guess an entire album like that would be kind of underwhelming unless you had some really talented people actually composing it all. And yeah, this is how this album ends, maybe a bit anticlimactically, but honestly I don't care because the journey itself was so so good, and it definitely showed me that the Canterbury scene type music can be far wider and bigger than what we normally hear with bands like Caravan. And honestly, I don't know if that's a smart thing to say, seeing as tomorrow we're gonna be reviewing another Canterbury band, which is considered to be one of the more contemporary Canterbury stuff, and that's of course Hatefield and the North. But oh boy, I'm rushing myself here, this is supposed to be something that I say at the end of the video. So for now, let's now talk about this album's cover art. So the original cover art for this album is the one that you can see next to me. There is a newer version in color, but honestly I think that this one looks kind of better. The painting that you can see right next to me on this cover is actually called Exhuming the First American Mestodon by C.W. Pale, and it doesn't look like a painting because it is of course very much pale and stripped from its original colors, but do trust me it is, and honestly it doesn't even look that similar to the original seeing it has been cropped, kind of distorted in a way and some pieces of it are highlighted. And across this cover you can actually spot seven Roman numerals, basically showing us seven scenes from the painting, which is of course also the aptly named title of the third track on the album. And now when I come to think of it, you know how we call tracks that share the same name as the album name title tracks, like the fourth track on this album called Q Rone? Well, what if the name of your track actually features what's on the cover? Would that be a cover track? I, I, don't, I don't, I'm not entirely sure. Anyway, this album honestly to me seems kind of shy of a 9 but very close to it, so for now I'm gonna give this one a very high rating of 8 out of 10. But that's about it guys, I hope that you enjoyed this video and stay tuned for tomorrow because we're gonna be listening to The Rotters Club by Hatfield and The North. This is the right time to say it, so I might as well do it now. I of course want to thank my lovely supporters over on Patreon, so thank you so much to Clay Wan and Rist of Kings and Lindsay Haycock. You guys are just the best and if any of you want to support me over on Patreon you can find the link down in the description or in my about page. But that's about it guys, have a wonderful day and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Bye guys.